I would just say from my experience of about four decades of being interested in this topic, I have never seen a group of scientists and uh, practitioners and kind of questions like this. I mean, this is inspiring to have come to this point. I think we're maybe coming to the corner of a watershed. Um, it's also, you know, in the afternoon of the second day, and I have the distinct pleasure of having had most of my slides already be presented by other <laughs> speakers, but I'm not going to skip through them because I want to try to pull them together in a somewhat different context. So my title is um, uh, um, not indirectly related to nutritional ketosis, and that's the first word is inflammation and how this impacts metabolic disease. Um, and what I want to do is try to bring, bring together a bunch of different lines of evidence uh, to have us look at something that, uh, and not to be adversarial, but goes a bit beyond insulin or insulin resistance and maybe goes a little bit under, further down kind of the pathway of, of the underlying pathophysiology. Um, so I'll tell you at the start that um, I'm going to talk about inflammation, but it's an extremely complex topic. It's not something where I have a com full command of, of that area. It's where you know, specialists focus in one aspect of, of infl inflammatory pathways. I want you to understand how complex it is, uh, but I'm not going to make it clear for you, other than to say that at the end of this point, I want to have you understand that nutritional ketosis um, appears to be an extremely powerful and hopefully safe tool to alter the body's inflammatory response. And the reason why I emphasize safety is if you mess with it the wrong way, you can kill people. If you, because inflammation is part of the body's normal healing and immune response. And if you cause too much immune down regulation, yeah, and I'll show you an example where that occurred and, and the result was that uh, uh, the intervention did as much harm as good because uh, it led to increased uh, infection and sepsis. So I've told you all the important things now. If you want to go out and <laughs> spend your Friday afternoon, you can do that. And I'm going to press a button here and I hope the screen doesn't go off. Uh, these are my disclosures. I'm not going to zip through this really quickly. I'm going to point out that um, the top line here is that I am a... Uh, I don't have much of a pointer. Anyway, uh, I am uh, founder and chief medical officer of Verta Health, uh, and with that, I am profoundly conflicted in what I'm going to tell you about. Uh, uh, yeah, I get in, I, this is my day job. Um, and so I'm not going to pass over that lightly, but the data I'm going to show you is published in the peer-reviewed literature. I'm not going to show you blue sky stuff. We do think about blue sky stuff. But it, uh, uh, so just, you know, anything I say that relates to Verta Health uh, look at that very critically. Um, in terms of inflammation, one of the things that makes this so difficult is nature has probably had a billion years of multicellular organism um, uh, evolution. And what that has done is given nature plenty of time to come up with layer after layer after layer of how the, the cells in an, organized, in an organism interact with each other to modulate its growth and its defense against uh, external external um, uh, uh, challenges. Uh, and so th this is basically an alpha alphabet soup of various things uh, in here. I do want to point out that uh, probably the original biomarker of inf inflammation that we as physicians uh, uh, have been tracking is the total white blood cell count, um, which goes up when we become injured or, or infected uh, and goes down when we resolve that process. Um, but then there are many others. There are soluble mediators, there are adhesion molecules, adipokines. Um, uh, and one of the adipokines is leptin and then adiponectin. Uh, and these, these, again, are protein compounds that are made in the periphery and signal the brain. Um, acute phase reactants like CRP, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on. Um, and then at the bottom, it talks about, or it mentions inflammatory enzymes. And these are things like cyclooxygenase that makes these uh, compounds called prostaglandins, leukotrienes, uh, thromboxanes. And these are signaling molecules that are made from polyunsaturated fats. They're not proteins. Um, and they've been extensively uh, studied over, over time and have led to a whole bunch of drugs. Um, uh, that have been developed to modulate them. And again, we do that with our peril because if we can become too focused on changing just one enzyme, we can end balance the system. And that's what happened with COX-2 inhibitors. Uh, you know, that we're, we're going to irritate your stomach, we're still going to relieve your pain. But also, they didn't, they, they didn't block cancer formation, which the COX, or the, uh, the nonspecific uh, 
uh, compounds do. So to try to put this in the context of, of real medicine, uh, I, I want to point out that in the last decade, there's been an increasing uh, line of evidence that says that type 2 diabetes is an inflammatory mediated disease. And not only is it mediated, that inflammation and biomarkers, depending on which ones you pick, predict the, the eventual um, incidence of type 2 diabetes. So infl inflammation seems to be part of the root process that uh, makes the body more vulnerable to insulin resistance and eventually type 2 diabetes. Uh, and you know, these, these, the authors on, on these the two papers are not minor players. This is mainstream science. This is not um, uh, wild conjecture. Um, uh, the next thing I'll point out just historically is that we've known about this uh, interaction with uh, inflammation and disease for about three decades. Uh, and the first place that it really became apparent to me as an internal medicine doctor interested in these kinds of things was when it, it uh, became clear that um, uh, total white blood cell count was a predictor of coronary disease risk independent of cholesterol. And here are a couple papers, one from 91 and one from 92. The second one was co or lead author was William Cannell from the uh, Framingham Project. And you know, they, they had become very focused on, on cholesterol and saturated fat and, and how that was uh, predisposing patients in and, and, uh, this um, Framingham project to uh, coronary artery disease. But as he was kind of digging through his data, he noticed that, you know, white blood cell count, people in the normal range, not people with markedly elevated white cell counts, but in the normal range, total white blood cell count um, predicted coronary risk. And for each one unit, and the normal values range from about 4.5 to 10, but for each one unit, if you go from 5 to 6 or 6 to 7, there's about a, a, a 15 to 20% increased risk of coronary disease in the normal range. Um, and this kind of sat there on the, you know, on the periphery, and nobody really wanted to address it for a couple of reasons. One is we don't, didn't know why it worked, and the other is we didn't have any drugs that could treat that, but we were coming up with increasingly with drugs to treat cholesterol, so that really was our focus, you know. And when you ask the, the guy looking for his, his lost keys, and he's looking under the light, you know, well, you know, um, you know, did you drop them here? Well, I know I dropped them over there. Well, why are you looking over here? Because this is where the light is. So uh, We kind of ignored this information, and really it... it uh, was the, measure, the, the development of a sensitive test for measuring C-reactive protein and other of these uh, inflammatory cytokines um, that um, uh, uh, gave us the opportunity to, to look at this in a more objective way. Uh, and uh, it was the development of the hypersensitive, high sensitivity CRP test by Paul Ridker and the group at Harvard that um, really led to the resurgence of, of this interest in inflammation and heart disease. And as you can see here, as you go from the lowest quartile to the highest quartile of CRP, which is the, the tall um, uh, dark bars, the two on the right indicate that higher levels of CRP are associated with um, uh, a, a, a three to fourfold increased risk in uh, coronary disease relative to uh, the lowest two quartiles. Uh, so again, it's not a small... You know, this is not a 0.5 or a 1. This is a 2-3 uh, relative risk uh, increment uh, for inflammation and coronary disease. Um, but the temptation here was, okay, let's find something that will lower CRP and see if it changes heart attack risk. And it turns out that the, the current um, uh, uh, commonly used statin drugs uh, uh, not only lower cholesterol through its action on HMG-CoA reductase, but they also lower CRP. And the actual mechanism through which the statin drugs lower CRP is not well known. Um, but it's a, it's a, a robust phenomenon, and, and typically you can lower CRP anywhere from, uh, anywhere from 20 to 40 percent, depending on the starting values of people. And so what they decided to do, and they you know, tried to get funding from uh, uh, the NIH to do this study and were rejected, and so ev eventually they got funding from the, the, uh, the company that manufactures rosuvastatin to do this. And you can imagine, this is a lot of money because they recruited almost 18,000 people, and these are people without prior heart disease, so this is a primary risk prevention study. But they screened people uh, to pick people who were in the lowest half of, of, the, co of the cohort in terms of LDL cholesterol but in the highest half of the cohort with, uh, of CRP. So they took people with relatively low LDL, relatively high CRP, on the hope that they weren't going to change LDL much with a statin, but they'd lower CRP. 
Uh, and they treated them, this pe group of people, for 1.9 years when they stopped the study because uh, the Data and Safety Monitoring Committee said you've, you've clearly got a treatment effect uh, benefiting the statin. So they stopped the, the, the study at that point where the hazard ratio was 0.56 and a very pr impressive p-value. Uh, the criticism of the study, of course, is there was a primary prevention study and they only had about 47 different, a difference of 47 events between the two groups, even though they're treating thousands of people. Um, but it uh, indicated that, that the statin uh, use in this cohort reduced coronary risk significantly. Uh, and, but in spite of the fact they started with people with LDLs that were under 130, they dropped the LDL value by 50%, but they also lowered CRP by 37%. So, you know, the good news is that in that cohort of people, it looked like as a primary prevention tool, statin could reduce coronary uh, risk. Um, the bad news is that it, the yield of, of lives saved is very small for a very, very large number of treatment, people treated because it's a primary prevention study. Now, that study was published in 2008, and here, it's really fascinating because four years later, they had the data. Four years later, they published a, a, a paper that said, oh, by the way, the people who got, were randomized to the statin drug had a 30% increase, 20% increase in their incidence of type 2 diabetes. Now, this is what I call a statin paradox. That, you know, we have evidence that diabetes is, is uh, increased, the prevalence is increased with people with higher levels of inflammation. And here you have a drug that lowers inflammation, inflammation and it reduced the coronary risk in this population, but it increased their, their, uh, the, prev or the incidence of type 2 diabetes which gives us a very important warning. This is complex, it's not simple. You can't make it, well, I, I, one biomarker, we change the biomarker, we get a beneficial effect. Because as I showed you, there are lots of biomarkers. Nature has had a billion years of multicellular organisms to create this very complex web. And this is like pulling one, one thread out of a, you know, the sweater that your grandmother knit, you know? You pull one, one thread out and the whole thing comes apart. Uh, messing with one thread in this system can be dangerous. And that was made very clear because when this study, study they got the result that didn't prove that it was lowering CRP, that reduced the heart attack risk, they said, well, let's find something that we isn't going to change cholesterol at all. Um, so they uh, recruited a, 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 a pharmaceutical company that makes a, a product called Canakimumab, which is an NATNF, I'm sorry, IL-1 beta, uh, antibody. So this is a monoclonal antibody that uh, basically attaches to and then activates one of the inflammatory meteors in this complex uh, pathway. And they uh, recruited 10,000 people um, uh, and they uh, used three different doses because they weren't sure, sure which dose would be, be most effective. Um, and uh, the, the study went on for four years. Um, uh, and they reduced the, the CRP by anywhere from 26 to 41 percent in a dose-dependent manner. So the higher the dose, the better reduction in, in CRP. And again, it's a good news, bad news joke. The good news is that they reduced uh, the heart attack risk uh, in a not quite dose-dependent manner, but about a, a 15 percent reduction in coronary risk with this injected monoclonal antibody. But the bad news was that they didn't save lives. That they Heart attack risk and the, and the death from, from coronary disease was reduced significantly, but the overall mortality did not go down because of an increase in, in sepsis, that is, you know, uncontrolled infection in the patients, which again, they're pulling on one thread on a very complex mix, uh, and they destabilize the system, uh, which means we, we need to go here very, very cautiously because this is a, a very uh, uh, important process across the whole range of, of human functions. So are there nutrients that can reduce inflammation? And I don't want to get into this. There are, you'll read every week about a new you know, bark from some, some tree in, in the Amazon that they, you know, and I don't laugh because chinkana alkaloids have cured a lot of people with malaria. Uh, things from bark are important, you know, but there are some antioxidants and things like that from bark that are highly touted but have very, very modest effects. Um, and uh, it's still controversial uh, three or four decades after the idea that omega-3 fats will reduce coronary risk. You know, eating fish or having fish oil uh, fats in your blood are associated with reduced reduce risk, but the, the data from feeding fish oils as an anti-inflammatory uh, and uh, uh, compound is, and, and reducing heart attack risk is not, uh, not a clear uh, area of, 
of understanding at this point. I will mention that in the past, for, for a company I no longer work for because it went bankrupt uh, 15 years ago, uh, came up with a nutrient mix of, that included a, um, uh, the most common form of tocopherol in nature, gamma tocopherol. We mixed it with one of the fish oil fatty acids, DHA, add, threw in some flavonoids and gave it to people and we could reduce their CRP levels by 50% in two weeks with this nutrient, or with this nutrient combination. Um, uh, but we didn't have any way of, of basically marketing that. Uh, we did get some patents on that. By the way, those patents, when this company went bankrupt, were acquired by Johnson & Johnson and McNeil. And they've paid the, the maintenance on those patents, and they haven't done anything with this, uh, this nutrient mix that lowers CRP and other biomarkers of inflammation. Uh, and you wonder, why do they do that? And by the, you just might happen to know that they own the patent. I'm, I'm not attacking them. Don't sell your stock in the company. But you know, they own Tylenol and Motrin which don't do much to lower these inflammation environments. No conspiracy, but... <laughs> so, so let's get positive and talk about nutritional ketosis. And uh, again, back in the late 1970s when I was working with uh, some remarkable people, Dr. Ethan Allen Hitchcock Sims in Vermont and Ed Horton in Vermont, and they were teaching me about um, uh, you know, human uh, meta energy metabolism and obesity and diabetes. And by the way, I think Ethan Sims is the person who came up with the term diabetes back in the 1970s. Um, and we did a study uh, looking at, at a ketogenic diet and people and measuring physical performance changes over multiple weeks. And when we published a paper, we had to distinguish between ketoacidosis and ketosis. And Jeff Volek, they made this very clear in his talk yesterday, a tenfold difference between the two. But we, as physicians back then, and most of us still now, don't differentiate between the 1 to 3 millimolar and the 10 to 20 millimolar values. So we decided to call the one to three nutritional ketosis to imply something different than the pathophysiology of type two diabetes. And you, know, uh, uh, you heard Dr. Newman's talk uh, 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 of brilliant work that he's done and beautifully presented that you know, beta-hydroxybutyrate is not just a, a, a alternate fuel, not just a very good fuel, but it's also a very potent signaling molecule and has multiple activities in the body. And again, this is just noting the, the, the work that he has done with at the Gladstone Institute and now at the Buck Institute with Dr. Eric Verdon. Uh, and this is game-changing research because it's demonstrating that beta-hydroxybutyrate is a very potent signal that downregulates a class of enzymes uh, that uh, regulate our endogenous inborn capability to defend ourselves against oxidative stress. And as Jeff pointed out yesterday, when you eat enough carbohydrates that your ketones are under 0.2 or 0.3 millimolar, you put that system to sleep. So why do you have to eat kale and take vitamin E pills and selenium and vitamin C every day? It's because the stuff you were born with isn't working because you put it to sleep by eating a bagel in the morning. That's a radical view, but uh, it may be that the high level of antioxidants we need when we eat carbohydrates is a conditional requirement because we're eating the carbohydrates, and that to a great extent we're defended by an endogenous system when we're in nutritional ketosis. And this is the first step in understanding a mechanism of that type. Now, what's the, what's the connection between um, uh, reducing oxidative, the results of oxidative stress and inflammation? And it turns out that um, there's a very complex set of molecules that were discovered by uh, Jack Roberts at uh, uh, Vanderbilt University back in the early 1990s. Um, and he's a, he does mass spec analysis of, of various compounds, cellular compounds. And he came across a group of compounds that looked like prostaglandins, but they weren't prostaglandins. And they were everywhere in the body. And they weren't just being made a little bit here, a little bit there like prostaglandins. There was a lot of them being made. And he called them isoprostanes. And what these are is these are derivatives of arachidonic acid, which is yeah, no pointer capability here. So at the top there, that squiggly horizontal U-shaped molecule over there is a 20-carbon long fatty acid with four double bonds. Uh, and those, every one of those double bonds is a very vulnerable to attack by reactive oxygen species. When you take that compound and you act up arachidonic acid and you act on it by, by cyclooxygenase, you purposely add two oxygens to that molecule and make it into a ring-like ring structure. But when reactive oxygen species come in contact with arachidonic acid absent any enzyme control, they create a lot of very similar compounds. And like many of the compounds that are made from arachidonic, the, the prostaglandins made from arachidonic acid, which are pro-inflammatory, these isoprostanes also can be very pro-inflammatory. 
And so their unregulated production as a result of high production of reactive oxygen species leads to a group of, uh, it, an uncontrolled production of a group of highly reactive compounds that do us, can do us harm and raise you know, inflammatory processes in the body. Uh, you know, probably haven't heard too much about this because you know, so far we don't have any drugs that, that block this process. And the, com the number of these is, is complex. There are at least 16 commonly created um, species of adducts of reactive oxygen species to uh, arachidonic acid. And then they also act, react with uh, icosapentaenoic acid, the omega-3 20 carbon, and the dilcosahexaenoic acid, which is a 22 carbon fatty acid of fish oil, and those produce a range of compounds. So this is basically a, a, a nomenclature mess, and nobody wants to deal with it. Uh, but it's ongoing, and it uh, appears to be uh, having an effect in terms of damage in tissues in, in the body, and the damage to those tissues can alter a bunch of, of um, uh, normal physiological processes like insulin resistance. Um, again, you heard from Dr. Dominic D'Agostino yesterday and others about the NLRP3 inflammatome, which is uh, blocked by beta-hydroxybutyrate. So I want to get into clinical data. Um, and Jeff mentioned this study yesterday, and this is a study that he did in his lab uh, in the PhD research of uh, Dr. Cassandra Forsyth. And what they did was recruit 40 people with metabolic syndrome and uh, randomize them to two treatment arms. And each treatment arm was, was three months in duration. So they're, they're done in parallel. And one treatment arm was they were put on a calorie-restricted low-fat diet, the middle the circle there with 58% carbohydrates and 24% and fat. Now, this is not what their bodies are burning. This is what they're eating on their plate. So it's about 1,500 calories, so calorie restricted from a group of people who are probably eating 1,000 more, are burning more than 1,000 more calories per day. So what you're not seeing on those, those pie charts of macronutrients is the donation of body fat. So the actual... Um, uh, fat oxidation for the group on the low carbohydrate diet on the right, what the body was burning was probably closer to 75% fat because of the contribution from body fat. And the proportions of carbs and protein are somewhat lower. But the low carbohydrate diet was eaten to satiety. And the way they designed it was they knew from putting groups of patients like this on this type of diet, they would undereat by about 1,000 calories. So they designed it as, okay, here's what we expect this group to eat, and here's what uh, will tell the other group to eat. They did it for 12 weeks. Um, uh, they were well matched for um, uh, the, the height and gender and, and such factors. And Jeff showed you this yesterday. These are the two weight loss curves. And again, the really fascinating thing here is for a group of people who are eating uh, the, the diet to satiety, their weight loss was about twice what it was of the group that was eating the calorie-restricted diet. Um, and uh, you could say, well, maybe that's because there's a caloric, a, me a metabolic advantage or, uh, to the low carbohydrate diet, but also these are outpatients, and they're living in the real world, surrounded by calories, and it may also, and quite likely would be, that they, you got better dietary adherence for the people on the, the low carb than, than the high carb diet. Um, but similar weight losses, um, uh, both groups were losing weight across the three-month period of time, greater weight loss than the low carbohydrate diet arm. Um, this slide uh, um, was designed to show you all the, the things that happen when you put people in a well-formulated ketogenic diet, and the things that are outlined in the green there are the components of metabolic syndrome. And you can see that abdominal fat goes down, and again, that's part of metabolic syndrome. Triglycerides are dramatically reduced, much more so on the, the uh, low-carbohydrate diet than the calorie-restricted diet. Uh, HDL cholesterol goes up. There's no drug that will make HDL cholesterol go up like 10 or 15% like that. And blood glucose goes down and blood insulin level go down. Now here I want to get into a little bit of detail because if glucose goes down, blood glucose goes down, but the insulin level goes down even more, the only explanation for that is either you messed up the lab assay or you have dramatic improvement in insulin resistance. And if you look at the, the, the two bars outlined in purple, the HOMA-IR, which is a homeostatic model of insulin resistance calculation, you can see you dramatically improved insulin resistance uh, in this population. Now, right to the right of that, not outlined, is leptin. And leptin is a, uh, met a, a, it's a protein signal made in adipose tissue that circulates through the blood, and the signal is re received by the hypothalamus in the brain and tells the brain 
how much fuel there is in, in adipose tissue. And the more leptin you have circulating in the blood, it should tell your brain to eat less food because you have too much in storage. So it's a satiety hormone. Now, as I showed you, these are people who are eating to satiety. They're losing weight. Uh, and if they're eating to satiety and losing weight, they're under-consuming calories because they're adequately satiated, and yet their leptin levels have, hit, have, have sunk very low. This is a striking paradox. You know, satiety hormone goes down and they're more satiated. And the only explanation that I know of, but I've been told I don't know anything about this field and I should shut up, is that they become much more leptin sensitive. And now there's evidence in uh, rodent models and some early evidence in humans has been published just in the last year that when your levels of biomarkers of inflammation are up, the brain actually is affected by that inflammation. And that an inflamed hypothalamus is leptin resistant and insulin resistant. So if we're trying to understand how these paradoxes are occurring, it may be, it's a, it's a viable hypothesis, that the higher levels of inflammation make it harder for the brain to, to, cheat or to, to receive the signals of satiety uh, and, and uh, the signal of insulin to take up glucose. Um, and so we're really, the inflammation is becoming a blocker for normal physiological responses as basic as, as uh, appetite and insulin signaling. And then the last thing I want to show you is the far right on the slide here, and I think Jeff and I are the only ones who've done this study in humans, and we've now done it, I think, three times. And that is, the people who are eating the high-fat, low-carbohydrate diet were eating three times as many grams of saturated fat per day as the people eating the high-carb, low-fat diet. And yet, when you look at blood levels of saturated fat, and again, we know from long-term stu observational studies that the higher your blood levels of saturated fat, particularly in the cholesterol esters and phospholipids, the greater your risk of heart disease, diabetes, and mortality. And so that led to this idea, well, if you are what you eat, if you eat a lot of saturated fat, your blood levels of saturated fat are going to go high and it's going to kill you. And there is truth to that, except that as Jeff and his team, particularly with the FASTER study, demonstrated that they more than double the, the, the body's ability to burn fat for fuel, and it's getting burned, and the levels go down. So there, it's a disconnect between the amount of saturated fat that one eats and the blood levels. I just wanted to throw that in because I love, it. I love paradoxes like that. So cutting to the chase with inflammation, and Jeff showed you this, these data yesterday. You know, he and his team measured 14 of those alphabet soup biomarkers, bioactive inflammatory agents. And of the 14, between the two groups, seven of them um, uh, went down in favor of the ketogenic diet. None of them went up in favor of the low-carbohydrate diet. And so this is not a single action changing just one of these, like the antibody against IL-1 beta. This is, appears to be a more across-the-board, orchestrated response uh, to the ketogenic diet. And the one other thing I'll point out to you is what, he, what Jeff didn't do, because I get into detail, uh -huh, I digress, is if you look at the second one down under uh, the seven biomarkers that did, did not differ between the diets, there's CRP, at least in this study, in three months, it didn't respond. So again, not all things that we call inflammation respond at the exact same, uh, with the exact same timing or with the exact, exact same intensity. Um, this is a very complex process. And you know, they're not all marching in, 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 in a, uh, a block like soldiers. So that's the science. Now I'm gonna tread into the space that Dr. Halberg uh, touched on earlier today because um, A, I think it's amazing data, and B, um, it says something, I think, some important messages for us. So as she pointed out, the, the VERTA program, which is basically a technological approach to delivering information to patients, monitoring the, the function of those patients on a pretty much real-time basis, and allowing one to do things like change medica diabetes medications on a daily basis because we have to take most of them away in as, as, much, as little as one month's time, that we have this ability to do this uh, in a safe, we hope safe and efficacious way. Um, and she went through the protocol design. By the way, these are not actors. Every one of these photographs here is of someone who signed a release to let us put their photograph up there. They're subjects in our study. Uh, these are the two papers that we published this year on our one-year trial outcomes in terms of diabetes management and, and coronary disease biomarkers. Um, Again, uh, I want to just once again mention that 
This is not something that just a few people out of 100 can do. We had 83% retention in, in the protocol with the active intervention at one year. Um, uh, again, we set the threshold for, for um, um, uh, nutritional ketosis at 0.5 millimolar. That's arbitrary, but you know, that was based on, on uh, uh, clinical responses and, and my experience over a number of decades of measuring ketones in people undergoing weight loss. But you can see that this cohort of people, uh, out to eight months, stayed at or above, on average, at or above 0.5 millimolar. Uh, so again, we have remarkable adherence um, to this and the, and the concept that just me and Jeff and three other people in the world can stay on a ketogenic diet for more than a year. I think, I think we hope we've gotten past that. Again, emphasize, this is a group of people who from day one are told to eat to satiety. We don't change our dietary recommendations in terms of, of how to eat. You eat to satiety. You keep carbs restricted to a point where you, hopefully you maintain nutritional ketosis. You eat protein in very distinct moderation. Typically not more than 10 to 15% of your daily energy needs is coming in as protein. And the rest is coming either from fat in the diet or fat from body fat stores. As people get out past eight months, you can see now they're stabilizing and they're getting it from fat from the diet. This is a very high fat diet. Um, but when, when formulated properly, including get a, getting adequate minerals in the diet, which isn't uh, all that easy because we take away groups of foods that are mineral rich, uh, uh, this can be done in an effective way. Um, so, we didn't mention very much about the fact that we had a usual care control group, but this shows a usual care control group for white blood cell count on the top. They did not change over uh, the course of the study. Uh, and again, both groups started in the normal range. The ketogenic diet patients uh, dropped promptly at 70 days uh, by um, uh, whatever this is, 0.7 um, uh, units, and that's a, probably a 10 to 15, that would translate from the Framingham study to a 10 to 15 percent reduction in coronary risk, and that was maintained out to one year. So you can see a, a prompt response in white blood cell count, and uh, that's sustained across the study. By the way, I did not, I forgot to mention that in, in most of the studies that were done looking at the effect of statins on CRP, when they measured white blood cell count, it doesn't go down with a statin. Statins don't work to lower white cell count, but they do lower CRP. This is what happened to CRP in our study. And what's really intriguing is the white cell count went down promptly. The statin, or the, the, the uh, CRP level, stayed up at, at the 10-week at the mark and didn't come down to the end of the year. But when it came down at the end of a year, uh, I love a p-value of 10 to 1, 1 times 10 to the minus 15th. You know, it's kind of robust. Um, uh, this, is a, this is the same level of effect that you get with high-dose statins. Um, uh, and then the question is, what effect does that have? Are, are we making their diabetes worse by making this go down? Because the statins, if you make it go down this much on a statin, I can't answer that question yet. Um, but we just happened, and I'll say this verbally because we haven't published this yet, we just happened to have, have about half of our patients in the cohort were on a statin when they entered the study. And unless there was a major change in their LDL, we didn't, cha we didn't change their statin dose. So uh, roughly half the people were on statins and half weren't on statins. And when we looked at the, the um, diabetes response to the, of the patients, which is a reduction in hemoglobin A1C, comes down promptly and is sustained to a year, we didn't see any difference in the responsiveness of, of their diabetes based on the um, hemoglobin A1C response, whether they're on a statin or not. So it does not appear at first look that the, the statin therapy interferes with the beneficial effects of a ketogenic diet. On, on type 2 diabetes. So we're beginning to trying to tease out some of the differenti differentiating pieces here. The other thing I'll point out to you is I, if you look at our company website, and Dr. Halberg pointed out that we have a 60% um, uh, uh, reversal rate, uh, but that's for people, that's for the 83% who stay in the study. And I'm a grumpy old internist, and I say, I look at how many people started the study, and it's, it's 47 is still a very impressive number. Because if you look at the statistics that, to their credit, Kaiser Permanente, which has, you know, takes care of 9 million people, uh, and they track things like you know, diabetes status, and they publish the data that less than 1% per year of the people with type 2 diabetes that they care for achieve this, these criteria for, for reversal or whatever you want to call it. Uh, so this is just 50 times better than the current standard of care. 
Um, and again, to point out that we're not talking about a single factor, and, uh, but when we look at a whole bunch of factors that are involved in cardiovascular disease risk, uh, it's not just the inflammation biomarkers. So the last two on the bottom here, anything to the right is the pa group of the, the patients who number was benefited, and to those with the gray lines to the left are the ones that, that got worse. And you can see there were a whole bunch of things that got better um, uh, in this process. Uh, uh, not just the inflammation biomarkers, but they are, are independent to a great extent from most of the others, including uh, cholesterol, this distribution, and the associated apoproteins. So, oh, I got three more minutes left. Oh, yeah, this is my next to last slide. Um, what I want to point out is that you know, it's, one has to get away from this reductionist approach of saying, well, there's only one important thing. You know, it's, it's only cholesterol or it's only insulin. Or there are a bunch of things happening. And the, as we learn more about nutritional ketosis and the effects of beta-hydroxybutyrate, uh, starting from the position that, that what I learned from the, the studies of Cahill back in the 1960s, that basically adipose tissue can release free fatty acids when insulin level is low. The liver makes ketones. Ketones feed the brain if there's not enough glucose around. Um, we now understand that that is still true. But not only do, do ketones feed the brain, they appear to be not just a good, but an optimum fuel for the heart that has not just cardiac fueling effects, but cardiotrophic effects. And we won't get into that. And then the really provocative thing is we have a lot of patients who come to us with um, nonspecific colon disease or irritable bowel syndrome. And when they go on a ketogenic diet, it's very common. We have not done a prospective study, but it's a very common observation that the irritable bowel syndrome gets better when people go on a ketogenic diet. And as we know, if you eat dietary fiber and you have an excellent microbiome, which we've heard about, that the combination of fiber and microbiome makes a four-carbon fat called butyrate. And the colon mucosa loves butyrate. It's its favorite, you know, it's, it's normal fuel when you're eating carbs and fiber. But it appears that beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is the same four carbon length, has one more oxygen on it. And we know that any cell that can burn butyrate can, can burn beta-hydroxybutyrate. And beta-hydroxybutyrate is a more efficient um, blocker of the NLRP3 inflammasome that it very well may be that to a great extent the liver making 50 to 100 grams of ketones per day can pretty much supplant the need for fiber-derived nutrients for the colon. I realize that's very provocative, but I'll just, you know, five years from now, we'll come back and revisit that. But the fascinating things that are happening now is we know it's anti, that the beta-hydroxybutyrate is anti-inflammatory. It affects recovery of muscle function. And um, as Dr. Newman mentioned, of, of studies that the, his, his group did at the Gladstone and John Ramsey's group did at UC Davis, uh, in well-done mouse studies, there's... Uh, uh, clearly an advantage for health span and, to some degree, long-term lifespan in animals. And again, uh, I won't be around to, to see the end of the human longevity study that, that eventually, will, hopefully, will get done. But, um, uh, you know, this is a, a, a pleiotrophic um, uh, a beneficial molecule. Uh, and we're still looking for the, the, the risks other than, you know, talking to your primary care doctor and the person says, oh, ketogenic diet is just a fad. So... My conclusions are pretty simple, you know, that there's no drug that will uh, uh, do what beta-hydroxybutyrate can do to uh, inflammation that is uh, proven safe and effective without side effects. And I would say statins probably uh, uh, are effective, uh, but the safety issue is raised by the fact that they're also diabetogenic. Um, that this um, uh, intervention with a low-carbohydrate diet producing ketones has a broad-spectrum effect on inflammation bioactive compounds, and then it's not a single targeted reductionist approach, and potentially so in so doing, you get a balanced response that nature's had a, about a billion years to figure out how to do safely without putting us at risk for impaired immune response or impaired healing. Uh, and that this is something when done and delivered in a safe, or a, a, a safe and effective way with patients can uh, result in benefits for many people. And I'll leave it with that. Thank you for your attention. Time for a question? Go ahead. Yeah, plenty. Thank you, Dr. Finney. Um, I've been keto for a year. I've pretty much followed a low-carbohydrate, moderate-protein, high-fat diet. 
Um, what I'm confused is I've, I've heard presentations from Dr. Benjamin Bickham who have actually said, don't fear protein and actually to prioritize protein. I just wanted to see if you can maybe clear up any confusion on that or if you have any comments on that. Um, I wish I had a study where we treated people with 10% protein, 20%, 13 in terms of daily energy intake and we could objectively say what are the pluses and minuses of that. Um, a couple things. Um, yeah, I realize that people of the Paleolithic diet persuasion believe that we should be eating 25 to 30% of energy as protein, uh, but that's based on projection of what we found uh, in middens, which is where people discarded you know, wastes from hunting or on cave floors. Uh, we don't know what they ate and what their dogs ate. Um, you know, so it, it, you know, we don't have precise food records, and I don't want to be you know, at all wry about that. Um, uh, but the higher one goes in protein above 1.5 grams per kilo reference or ideal body weight per day, the greater, the, again, there's a modest insulinogenic effect of, of protein and the more one tends to push down ketones, uh, particularly in insulin resistant people. So if you're insulin sensitive, you might be able to tolerate 30% of protein very well. But if, as the more insulin resistant you get, the more likely you are to end up with what we consider suboptimal ketones. And by the way, I don't talk about anything at, at 0.5 to 3 millimolar as elevated ketones. I talk about those as normal ketones. Um, so in that, what I consider the normal or desirable range, uh, it has to be individualized. And if, if you're measuring your, your ketones and they're above 0.5 and preferably above, up in the 1 to 3 range, then that amount of protein is great. The other thing that we are hearing more and more about is people doing pure carnivorous diets. And I've actually, I did an inpatient pure carnivorous diet. I first ketogenic diet done in athletes, we gave no vegetable matter at all. Uh, and we gave them the 1.5 grams of protein per kilo. We had to give them an extra gram of supplemental potassium a day because there wasn't enough potassium just in the meat. So for people eating a carnivore diet, they may need to eat 20 or 30% to get the potassium that's in the, in the flesh. Um, and so uh, you know, at, at, at eating 20 to 30% of energy protein, you get two grams of potassium a day. If you only eat the, our prescribed dose, uh, of 1.5, one, of 1 you're going to get one gram of potassium a day, and you need to eat five servings of fruit and vegetables to get the other gram, which is, uh, Dr. Mente didn't mention it, but in their pure study on sodium and potassium, you didn't get optimum cardiovascular health until you got uh, at least two grams of potassium per day. So it's a, I can make it a long story. It, it, uh, there are many ways of doing it right, and it has to be individualized. And the best way it, we have at this point to know if it's working, if, if you think the ketones are desirable, is prick your finger, measure the, the, the level, and there are devices to do that. And hopefully, in the not too distant future, we'll have non-invasive ways of doing it with continuous monitoring. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm an RN, and I work in chronic wound care right now. And as we see chronic inflammation in wounds that aren't healing, particularly in our diabetic patients, I was wondering if in, as you've worked with some of these um, diabetics long term, were patients with chronic wounds allowed into this group? Um, were they excluded because of the wounds? Or, and have you seen um, an effect with ketogenic diet in improved wound healing? Uh, excellent question. We, um, uh, for the purposes of safety in our, uh, basically our first kind of 2B level uh, the study uh, chose not to take people with significant end organ disease, so we excluded people with ischemic ulcers. Um, from my clinical practice experience with people with type 2 diabetes, um, one problem with people with um, uh, persistent glycosuria is not only do they lose glucose and some potassium in their, and magnesium in urine, they also lose zinc. Uh, and zinc deficiency can lead to market impaired recovery of wounds. So, uh, I always look for those horizontal lines in the nails that you maybe got in second year medical school or, or what you call Bose lines. Uh, so zinc nutriture, uh, I, but I, would, I heard Dr. D'Agostino's great talk yesterday and I'm really intrigued by the idea that we can actually speed wound healing with this as well. But I will tell you honestly, I haven't done a study to, to examine that in an objective way. Good question. Hope we get it answered. Yeah. Um, the Verda study uh, results are just amazing, and uh, the on real-time coaching and um, support that you get. So I'm interested in the 17% that didn't stick with it. Did you do exit interviews or to find out 
why it wasn't successful for them, if, the, if there was a commonality in that? Um, yes, we're actually very interested in that. We're uh, writing up, we, we did a, again, we're a startup company, so um, we follow all the necessary rules, but not the unnecessary ones. Um, and so I will just mention verbally that we recruited 10 patients who stayed active in the program but didn't respond well mm -hmm. in terms of weight loss or getting into ketosis or reduce, reversing their diabetes. Uh, and we tried to figure out, is that something that they couldn't do mm -hmm. um, biologically? And so we actually uh, um, brought 10 of them into a uh, Holiday Inn Express. We rented a metabolic cart and... Uh, we did resting metabolic rates in our Q tests. We all ate all our meals together. We did not monitor them continuously. They could, if they wanted to go out in the hall at night and go to a candy machine, they could. But all of them, within four days, got their ketones up above 0.5 millimolar. Had, uh, and uh, we did not find any uh, obvious metabolic defects in terms of fuel utilization. Um, but one of the things that, that they noted themselves spontaneously was that they were eating way too much protein. They said... You know, so we would have, have meals together and go to restaurants and order, uh, and they were surprised how satiating they found uh, four ounces or five ounces of, of, of meat, fish, or poultry if they put two pats of butter on top of it, as opposed to ordering twice as much of a lean cut. Um, uh, so there are, teaching these lessons is very hard to do, you know, and you can change people's knowledge fairly quickly. But changing their behaviors is much more challenging, and we have a lot to learn about doing that. Okay. So yeah, I, I, we're interested in it, but I don't have a magic solution for the, the roughly two-thirds who, who struggle with this and don't, don't get much benefit. I'm sorry, one-third, one-third. Yes? Great talk, thanks. So my question is related to inflammation. And so if you look at the intake or the change in intake of macronutrients over the last 60, 80 years, certainly the period that corresponds with the increase in obesity, diabetes, the one that's changed the most is not sugar, not carbs, not fructose, not total fat, not saturated fat, but omega-6 uh, PUFA, or in particular linoleic acid from vegetable oils, predominantly soybean oil. So that's the macronutrient that's gone up the most. And a lot of people, myself, well, some people, myself included, think that that is driving chronic disease through perhaps lipid peroxidation or something like that. We don't, make, there's a couple mechanisms, right? Um, but I haven't seen a lot of compelling or robust evidence linking consumption to disease. It's just a correlation at this point. Mm -hmm. So why do you, th if you agree with that, why, uh, why do you think that evidence hasn't come out in a robust way? You know, people are still recommending vegetable oil as the heart healthy option, right? And, and in, well, our, our, yeah. our country produces billions of tons of it a year. Yeah. Just, you know, to sell it, you've got to tell people it's good for them. <laughs> Pardon me for saying that. Is that it? I mean, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm actually very curious about this. I've spent about 10 years of my life looking at the human economy of, of essential fatty acids, doing adipose biopsies in people. Uh, and it's true that from 1960 when, or so, when Jules Hirsch in New York did adipose biopsies on people and found about 10% linoleic acid, 8 to 10%. Um, and just in the late 1990s, when I, I left academia at UC Davis and gave up doing many liposuctions on people, um, we found it to be about 18%. So it almost doubled the amount of linoleic acid in adipose. But the amount of arachidonic acid in our blood phospholipids hasn't changed. So there is a regulatory enzyme pathway, the fatty acid anabolic pathway of three enzymes, that appears to, to prevent that linoleic acid from proportionately from, to intake being made into arachidonate. Yep. Um, but the, the other issue is you're, you're right, that, that there, are, there are potential effects of, of doubling the amount of, of linoleic acid available in adipose tissue stores. Um, but I could digress way into that, and yeah. you probably don't want me to, but we can do it offline. Okay, it's, thanks. It's, 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 basically, it's a weak agonist, strong agonist um, relationship where you may be displacing some of the arachidonic acid in the tissues by too much linoleic acid. Uh, competing for the same positions. Dean McGann from Tucson. I've been uh, treating patients with a low-carb diet for the last 10 years, and we have treated about 16,000 patients. We have reports on insulin-dependent patients identical to Vitra. 
One thing we also found is that, talking about inflammation, we have had several patients that got rid of lupus, got rid of rheumatoid arthritis, unexplained, but that was based on their rheumatologist. They went in remission. Mm -hmm. People with migraine, we tell them 80% of people with bad migraine will definitely improve. So there is more than what we, and you mentioned the irritable bowel, yeah. That almost 90% improves. But there may be a correlation between autoimmune disease and the irritable bowel. I don't know. But this is uh, something uh, that should be really promoted much more than we do at this point. The one benefit in our system, the insurance companies pays for our program. That has been a, an issue talking to many people here. But you can convince the insurance industries how well you do. So, Thank you. And I'll just applaud you for doing the, the clinical work that gives you the volume of, of patients where you can create hypotheses like that. Uh, because, you know, again, I consider empiric observations a, a fruitful place for, to develop a hypothesis. But we, too, have many cases of, of um, uh, uh, autoimmune, what we call autoimmune diseases, but they're you know, endogenous, inflammatory-driven, uh, in, including um, uh, psoriasis where patients have had you know, reported dramatic improvement where no, nothing else had worked. But until we do a randomized control trial, that's a hypothesis and not a conclusion. But I applaud you for that. Uh, Dr. Uh, Ludwig. Just to dive a little more deeply into the Pandora's box of protein, uh, do you have a, so pr protein is anabolic. It, it has anabolic effects. It raises insulin, although it counterbalances with glucagon. Um, it also, uh, it, uh, regulates mTOR. Do you have concerns, is part of your concern with high protein intake beyond you know, the issue of ketogenesis and insulin resistance, do you have concerns about high protein intake and aging? Um, high protein intake and aging? I have personal concerns, yeah. <laughs> uh, truly. Um, uh, and Again, at the 1.5 gram per kilo, we're at about twice the, 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 you know, the non-pregnant adolescent recommended dietary allowance. But again, we tell people the range is 1.2 to 2. And if people feel a need or want to go higher, you know, they can. Um, in terms of anabolism being uh, enabled by protein intake, again, because we're dropping insulin down and because insulin is a... Um, uh, an anabolic hormone at the muscle of level, mu level of muscle anabolism. Uh, we, I worried about low insulin preventing patients, and, and, and particularly for athletes, from building or, or uh, repairing muscle protein. Um, and um, by chance on my dissertation project uh, back when MIT had a Department of Nutrition, and a guy named Vernon Young was one of the, the professors there, and he was one of the world's experts in amino acid metabolism. Um, Vernon said, well, Steve, let's run some, some uh, amino acid profiles on, on, on your patients, you know, your, your athletes before and after they are on the ketogenic diet. I said, I can't pay for it. He said, don't worry about it. We'll just do it. And what we found was that the three known anabolic amino acids in, in, in blood, human blood, which are leucine, isoleucine, and valine, the branch chain amino acids, you know, which are are a mixed bag in terms of their physiological effects, but they definitely stimulate protein anabolism. And they went up 25% in the first week on the ketogenic diet and stayed up for the duration of the time that, that my, my bike racer subjects were on the ketogenic diet. And we scratched our heads for that. And then the guy who published that 1976 diabetes paper um, that Dr. Hallberg mentioned, Dr. Bruce Bistrian, at the, then at the Deaconess, now Deaconess Beth Israel Med Center in Boston, Bruce pointed out to me that that uh, the branch chain amino acid carbon skeletons are uh, metabolized by uh, mitochondria. So, so they're, they're basically metabolized. This, uh, alpha, alpha keto isocoproate and, and the other branch chain skeletons are treated, metabolized as short chain fatty acids. And the beta hydroxybutyrate competes with them for, for um, uh, clearance. And so a couple of uh, guys in Belgium infused ketones into people in 1985 and showed that the branch chain amino acids go up when you infuse ketones without feeding people any protein. So there's really an elegant homeostasis here, of a, basically an alternate to insulin for an anabolism. 
Um, and so, I'm, again, it's this a fruitful area. You know, I'd love to have a couple of PhDs or postdocs working just on that topic alone. You mentioned at the beginning, um, if not done correctly, you could have catastrophic effects with the ketogenic diet. What, what did you mean by that? Or what, or what examples are you talking about? Sure. Um, very briefly, back in the mid-1970s, a person with an MD degree wrote a book called The Last Chance Diet, and this person advocated that people take hydrolyzed collagen, basically liquid jello that you could buy in bottles, and they could sell for profit, and drink four ounces of this liquid protein goop three times a day, um, take one gram of pota supplemental potassium, and take a vitamin pill. And it was called the liquid protein diet. And I don't know if any of you are old enough like me to have heard of it, but quite, quite soon reports were coming into the CDC of, of people with no history of heart disease and relatively young age who'd been on this diet for three months or longer uh, experiencing sudden death. And for some of them who made it to emergency rooms, they were in uh, ventricular tachycardia and, and it was very difficult to cardiovert them. Um, and uh, that was blamed on ketones being toxic to the heart. But it turns out, because they're only taking one gram of potassium and no sodium, there's no, nothing to shake salt onto, right? And there was no advice to take sodium. The result was that when you're sodium depleted, renin aldosterone, uh, 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 renin angiotensin stimulated aldosterone, which causes your kidneys to waste potassium to try to hang on to sodium, uh, and that hyperaldosteronemic state depleted them of potassium, and it was hypo, intramuscular potassium depletion that killed these people. So you can't just eat a low carb diet and not pay attention to the minerals because it, it can be fatal. And there were 60 reports of death. And that really shut down research in this field from the early 1980s until the late 1990s. Uh, so for, for the, the health of patients, I don't want to go there. And for the, the health of this movement and moving forwards in a way of finding how to use this wisely to the benefit of our patients, we need to do it right.